thank you for coming to our July Agico market update. So today we have a Don. Don is going to Don, Dr. Don Robinson. He's going to talk about about cotton market uh, update. Afterwards, uh, Yuri Khalil is going to give us an update on grains. And last, David Anderson is going to talk about life. So, John, whenever you want to start, let's put your hands and start. If you have any questions and you want to you know, just uh, after each presentation, you can ask questions or, you know, I, when we finish the three of them, okay? Feel free to ask questions or write them on the chat. John, whenever you want. All right, good morning. Thank you. Good morning, everybody. Hopefully the slides look uh, look okay and we'll just get into it. Um, here's where cotton prices uh, continue to be going sideways. If you look at the right-hand side of this chart, uh, we've been in a narrow band going back into last calendar year. We've been stuck between a, the futures price. This is the December harvest time uh, futures price. It's basically been stuck between about 79 and 83 cents, and we continue to be until something really dramatic comes along to uh, to blast us out of this range. And I'm the point of my talk is it could be good news that sends prices higher from here, at least for a little while, or it could be um, more bearish news that would push us down into the 70s. And it, I'm at this stage, I'm not really sure uh, what the outcome is going to be because it depends on a lot of moving parts. So let's look at some of those moving parts, beginning with the demand side, What's mostly in the news and what's potentially the biggest thing that could affect cotton consumption on the demand side is what's happening with the general economy. And lately, that's kind of been tied to this question of uh, fighting inflation and what the Federal Reserve is doing to fight inflation, to successfully fight inflation. So if you look at this chart, you've got this blue line. That's the inflation rate. Uh, down here at the bottom, it was almost zero, and then uh, inflation started climbing because to get us out of the pandemic recession, the the U.S. government pumped a lot of money into the economy, and that, that according to uh, uh, economics, would, uh, would raise the inflation rate, and it did, and inflation climbed, climbed all the way to the top. It peaked at 9%, which is like, you know, hadn't been that high since, uh, since the 70s. So then the, the Federal Reserve started, uh, uh, they had taken their foot off the brake, off the accelerator here. They started applying the brakes here. All these little red numbers, those are, those are raising the interest rates a quarter of a percent, a half a percent, three quarters of a percent. And they did that a whole bunch of times. They're, they're basically pushing the brakes of the economy to slow the economy and thereby uh, bring inflation down, and it's it's kind of worked. It was in the news last week that the latest the latest uh, consumer price index uh, inflation rate was three percent. So that's progress. They brought it down. So the question is, are they going to raise interest rates anymore? And the thought is, yeah, maybe they will, but only one more time, and not not two or three more times. And and that's good because, you know, they're slowing the economy deliberately to tame inflation. But what slowing the economy does is it tends to reduce cotton consumption, which is what this chart is showing. Cotton consumption is the blue line that's per pounds per person per year on average in the world. And on average, the average person consumes six or seven or eight pounds of cotton in a year. You could figure how many shirts or whatever that that uh, that is but it goes up and down and it goes up and down with the general economy so whenever there's a recession like there the dot-com recession or there the great recession or there the pandemic recession whenever there's a recession cotton consumption tends to decline because people don't buy you know they put off buying new clothes and towels and sheets so the million dollar question is is the result of all this interest rate uh, raising of interest rates, is that going to bring about a recession? Historically, it tends to, um, but we're at the tail end of it, hopefully. So it's kind of an open question, and you can get a lot of different opinions listening to the business press and reading different economists about whether or not 
uh, we're going to go any lower in our economic growth rate and our cotton demand than where we are right now. And I, I don't have the answer to it, but to the extent that world economic growth is lower than cotton consumption is probably going to be lower. So I'm, I'm calling that a headwind, this business of how the economy is growing. You know, it's just sort of slowing down the, pot, the potential for cotton prices. You know, it's not helping. Nobody thinks we're going to be in a boom time, like like coming out of that recession or out of that one. And, you know, an upward surge in economic growth would raise prices, but I don't see that. Nobody sees that. What we're we're worried about whether or not we can avoid a recession. So we'll see. All right. So that's that's the moving parts related to demand. Let's talk about supply. It's a big question about how many acres of cotton we're going to be planted this year because everybody thought there'd be fewer and there are going to be fewer. The latest projection down here at the bottom is uh, the planted acreage report we had at the end of June and USGA kind of confirmed all their previous trends. They confirmed it with a guesstimate of a little over 11 million acres planted. So what they did was take that number 11 million and they plugged it up here uh, for planted acreage for the 23, 24, this last column of numbers. They stuck that 11 million acres there and they made an assumption about harvested acres. That's this number here. They made an assumption about what the yield's going to be. And they're coming up with a guesstimate right here in the middle of 16 and a half million bales of production. But friends, I'm here to tell you that is a wide open guess and subject to a lot of change because this year has been, I don't have to tell any of y'all out in the field, this has been a weird year. We started off, we started off with a drought. This this is the drought monitor map back at Easter time. Terrible drought, widespread. Then of course it rained for weeks and weeks and weeks. This is this is a picture of June rainfall. That's a lot of rain. And then it got really, really hot. This is the heat wave in June. It kind of paused and then we have had another heat wave that we're still in. There's a dome of high pressure that's going to float over from Arizona, New Mexico and West Texas and float over Central Texas and that's going to make it super, super hot again. So what is the effect of the combination of drought, flooding rains and excessive heat? And I'm here to say I don't know what I don't know how all that adds up, but potentially we could have a lot fewer bales than what USDA is forecasting. We could have a, easily have a million fewer bales than what USDA is forecasting. On the other hand, you know, it could swing the other way. And I can't say right now, you know, there are some people out there that think that we're going to have 17 something million bales nationally. It just remains to be seen. And we won't know. I mean, jump right to here. We won't know until we get this this final information flow these reports that are going to come in starting in August and through throughout the fall and at various times through the fall, we're going to get updated data from different parts of USDA about how many acres are there, what the harvested acres is and what the yield is and how many bales have been classed and how many bales are going to be ginned. We're eventually going to know all this stuff and then it's going to become clear. But I'm just saying if there's a surprise if there's a surprisingly low amount of production, like if it's 15 million bales, or if there's a surprisingly high amount, like 17 million, this market could bust out of this sideways pattern that it's been in. And it could, you know, on the one hand, we could have prices shoot up to 89 cents or 90 cents if, if, if the crop is a lot smaller than we're expecting right at the moment. And the, the reverse is true. We could have prices slide under under 80 back into the 70s if it turns out that we have, you know, a healthy sized crop. And at this this point, I don't really know what to tell you, except this has been a whole lot more uncertainty than normal. And it has price implications and it could swing in either direction. And that's where I'll wind up. Um, and I'll stop sharing the screen and answer any questions uh, that anybody might have. Otherwise, I'll hand it off to Yuri. Any questions for John? Yuri, do you want to put your slides up? Yep, let me share my screen. Uh,
Can you see it, Pancho? Yeah, are you, are you on mute? Now, now they look perfect. Thank you, Uri. Whenever you ah. want to start. Oh, here we go. Well, uh, today I'm going to talk about like three topics mainly that Dr. Well share with me. The first one will be about the waste report. The second thing that I'm going to talk about is about the corn crop condition. And then I'm going to talk a little bit about the weather and how the weather has been affecting the corn. And I'm going to conclude talking about uh, the prices. Overall, things didn't change that much from the previous month in the overall results. So here we have the, our picture of supply and demand. And the USDA, as you guys can see, the first thing in the area over here, planted area, there are more like 2.1 million uh, acres planted of corn than expected. Meanwhile, we can see that uh, the prediction yield decreased from 181 bushels per acre to 177.5. So, in one hand, we have increasing area. In another hand, we have a decreasing yield. As a result, one thing offsets the other. And you see the total supply over here that's going to increase only 5, uh, five million bushels. Oh, in other words, it's not a big, big change in total supply. Another thing that calls attention over here is the beginning stocks. There's a decrease in 50 million bu bushels because uh, the raise in feed and use uh, was bigger than the, the, the reduction in uh, ethanol and exports. So we have this figure in beginning of stocks. Also, we can see at the demand side, there is not so much change. Uh, as a result, we can see that USDA expect about the same price as the previous waste. Also, there's a lot of other kind of offsets. We see, I mean, in the world, we see like Canada and Ukraine increasing production of corn and European Union decreasing. We also see Brazil increasing the production of corn and Argentina decrease in the production of corn. When you look to the road, we're going to see the foraging corn ending in stocks will be virtually the same. So no big change in the fundamentals, even though we have this change in area and yield. Here we go. Uh, here we can see the corn crop conditions ratings. What we see here is that we, in the black line over here, we see that we start to getting worse and worse, and then the rains uh, help a little bit, and the cooler temperatures improve the quality of the crop. Well, the corn crop condition index is calculated as following. Five times the excellent, four times the good, three times the fair, two times the poor, and one times the very poor. So, uh, wait a minute. Eh? Let me, all right. So here we have the corn crop uh, condition index. Uh, when we contrast to the last year in the black line, we see that we have like a sharp decline in the quality of the crop and has been improving since uh, the week 24 because of the rains. This picture makes us question about the forecast yield of the USDA. USDA forecasted 177 bushels per acre, but as we can see over here, the quality of the crop still below the last year and the yield was 173. So it remains to see if this yield gonna hold or not. Uh, over here, we have the picture for the corn belt of the U.S. drought monitor. Well, uh, although we have some better areas in the Dakotas, overall, there's the, the drought is spread. So to better picture this, I'm going to bring the next slide that brings here the drought severity and coverage index. So 
it's we can clearly see that this year we are way worse than the last year. How this index is calculated? Well, it's the same thing. Uh, five times the worst condition, then four times uh, extreme drought, uh, two times severe drought, and one time uh, moderate drought. We see that we still, and the drought is stronger than previous years and is stronger than the average. So, over here, we have the following information. We have the growing degree days. What does GDD, growing degree days, means? Uh, it means the following. is the amount of heat accumulated above a specific threshold that allows for biological growth. How does this is calculated? For example, we have this threshold of 50. So if the temperature in a certain day is 51, we have one GDD added. If the temperature is 80, we have 30 GDD added. So this is allow us to capture the amount of heat that influence the growth of the plant, of the corn. So uh, the picture clearly contrasts here the, uh, the year that we are going on to 2023 to 2012. And we see that this year is not as bad as the drought of 2020. 12 when you see when we talk about the heat but when we look below in the precipitation and the stress degrees days over here we see that we are drier than the the 2012 uh drier year also the blue lines and the the bands means the maximum and the minimum so the message is well we are drier we have less rain than in 2012, but the temperature is not as hot as in the 2012. So, uh, over here, uh, the picture depicts the price. This is a um, uh, candle, candlestick graph. And how we read this graph is the following way. So, the green bars means a uh, bullish candle. Here is the uh, in the down here is the opening and up here is, is the closing prices, and the red graph means the bearish situation with the opposite situation. The up on the top is the opening mark and down uh, is the closing mark. We see that as as the expectation for drought decreased a little bit, the prices went down. At the at the end of the June and beginning of July, they are moving sideways. So. Uh, when we look at forward, there's a, uh, besides the weather, there are two other things to see. There's the Black Sea deal going on. Some people are afraid and Russia said that they will not sign that deal. So that's a source of uncertainty. Also, another thing, uh, as commented before, uh, as the inflation is, the price of the dollar decrease relative to other currencies which makes uh, the U.S. commodities more competitive in the international markets. So if, we, if the value of the dollars decrease, we make the core more competitive, so we may expect a little bit more pressure upward in the prices. However, the weather condition is still an uncertainty, and we kind of uh, need to watch a little bit more closely. That's what I have, uh, Pancho. Excellent, Yuri. Thank you very much. Uh, if you have any questions for Yuri, please be welcome to ask as, many, as much as you want. John, here they are asking if, you know, where did you get the map on rainfall amounts? I don't know, John, are you still there? I'm here. Um, uh, usually, I think I downloaded it uh, from NOAA, the National whatever. Oceanic Atmospheric Association. NOAA's got a bunch of different charts, accumulated rainfall, and and uh, looking ahead, the forecast maps and stuff. That's that's usually where I get them from, the NOAA site. There's a bunch of stuff there if you go there. Excellent, David. Whenever you're ready. Great. Let's see here.
How's that, Excellent. Pancho? Does that look okay? Look, looks great. Thank you. All right. Well, guys, great to be with you all today. Uh, thanks for joining us. Uh, heck, let's jump right into some livestock market stuff. I'm going to start with lamb. Uh, the lamb market, uh, I don't usually on these things spend a lot of time on it, but I thought there's a couple of interesting things in the market going on. Uh, for those of you that have uh, some uh, sheep and lamb and, and, and goat folks in your, in your area, uh, I thought I'd hit a couple of these first. Uh, the first. The first chart I'm gonna use is really slaughtered lamb prices, and, and these are 60 to 90 pounds. These are not, you know, the traditional heavy heavy uh, lambs. These are lightweight ones. And, and what I'm using here is a three market average, San Angelo, uh, market in Colorado and a market in South Dakota. You know, we have so many more lambs going to slaughter at these light weights. Uh, certainly anybody that's been following this market knows the sharp decline we had in lamb prices really starting last early last year, the first half of last year. Uh, and and so I thought I'd just kind of start with that and and with a lot of volatility from week to week, you know we're a little bit below the five year average. We're about to where we were in terms of price last year, uh, really with that declining price, but not a lot of improvement really overall across all of these markets in in these lighter weight lambs. We're a lot closer to kind of the five year average. Uh, not counting last year, and certainly we don't see a, a lot of recovery yet in 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 lambs yet. Yet I think there's some things in the market that suggest that that we ought to that that we'll start to see some price improvement. Um, in fact, one of those things, if we look at heavyweight lambs, uh, if I and and what I, the data I'm using here is what's called from USDA AMS the National Negotiated Price Live Price. And, and these are heavyweight lambs, and, and I could use some markets where uh, it's more normal that heavyweight slaughter lambs go through those markets rather than, than you know, we don't get as like a lot of those at San Angelo. Uh, but certainly in these heavier weight lamb prices, uh, we've got some, some pretty strong growth in prices, an upward trend below the five-year average still, but, but a, a, a fairly, you know, robust, robust growth in prices. Um, and and those heavier weight animals, I think it implies that we've got some tighter supplies happening of those, uh, and we've got some growth in prices. And so, you know, I think that's fairly encouraging for the rest of the year. Uh, a couple other things in the market are imports. Uh, if you follow this market, you know that we import more uh, than we produce ourselves. Uh, yet so far every month this year, the latest data being it uh, through May, uh, we're importing less than we did last year. In the last couple of months, we imported less than the five-year average. You might notice March being a, a fairly large month of uh, most years, and that's really driven by imports ahead of, of Easter in the, in the holiday market. Uh, so, uh, you know, this I think is pretty positive for the market in terms of, of cutting supplies. I did a little calculation. We're actually producing a little bit uh, fairly close to the same amount of lamb so far this year that we did last year domestically, yet our imports are smaller. And, and what that really implies is that we're, we're our, the, the, the market share of imported lamb into our market is a little smaller than it was last year. But again, this is uh, some reduced uh, pounds coming our way, and, and I think that's also positive. One of the other important things in this market is the amount of lamb uh, in frozen cold storage. Uh, while we're running a little more than we did a year ago, we're well off that five-year average. Um, and, and really this decline in imports, about the same amount of production uh, given the amount we're moving in the marketplace. And, and so that this number isn't growing much faster uh, is I think also a positive in the market. So so given the, the depressed nature of prices really over the last year, I, th I think there are some hopeful hopeful spots in the marketplace and with a little tighter total supplies, some opportunity for for higher prices. Um, I haven't I haven't used a goat slide in a long time, but I figured I'd just show some San Angelo goat prices. These are kids and yearlings uh, number ones. Um, and and look at that 2023, which is the solid blue line, which we saw a heck of a big increase, not up to those really sky high elevated prices of a year ago, but a pretty darn healthy increase from about 
uh, $350 a hundred weight to about 425. That has slipped dramatically. And, and quite honestly, we, we do see seasonally, normally prices decline in uh, through the summer before building again. But just a little quick shot of what we see in the marketplace for, for these critters as well. So just to kind of cover the, the waterfront of a whole bunch of other livestock species that many of us deal with, uh, here's a couple things on, on lamb and goats. Let, let's jump to cattle for a second. Uh, I'm using feeder steers, 750 pound, uh, number one steers, Southern Plains, uh, really dramatic increase as we all know. We've seen some, some pretty darn high prices if you're looking at auctions and look at some of feeder cattle prices. Uh, they slipped in the last week. Um, and, and quite honestly, if we looked at some expectations uh, for profitable placement, uh, the relationship between these heavy feeders and fed cattle probably suggests that, that you know, a little bit of, of decline in price was probably uh, in the cards if we look at expected feedlot returns over the next uh, bunch of months. Really, to make this uh, over $2.30 a pound heavy feeders work, uh, I need a futures market that's higher than it is right now. Uh, and so that would suggest some projected break-evens later in the year uh, and into next year uh, not looking very good. Uh, so, you know, if we think about that, you know, that we see maybe see some retrenchment in prices a little bit, shouldn't really be surprising. But I think if we look at this growth in price year over year compared to the five-year average, you know, it just reinforces we're headed to higher prices and, and my expectation is higher prices over the next couple of years just due to tighter supplies yet we continue to have uh, good demand not only for fed cattle from packers but beef from consumers so you know we continue to see i think a lot of positives in in the marketplace uh for cattle as well fed cattle prices uh, you know, those have backed off a little bit yet. They, you know, we see a lot of up and down, a little volatility in prices. We should point out that normally seasonally, uh, we tend to see the lowest prices a year uh, going into late summer. Uh, you know, really where we are now uh, through August, even into September yet uh, with tighter supplies and increasingly tight supplies, the opportunities there for some counter seasonal movement in prices where Prices remain above a year ago uh, with that positive demand. I mentioned something about uh, returns to cattle feeding. Uh, this is a little calculation I fool with a lot in terms of returns to cattle feeding. Uh, green, the green bars up, that's good news, that's positive. The, the bars going down, that's bad news. And if you look at the last, uh, heck, almost a year, some pretty great positive returns to cattle feeding. Uh, in fact, my last month of data, uh, over 400 bucks ahead. Uh, again, you know, placements that were placed, let me go back a couple of things, uh, placements that might have been placed early in the year, uh, finishing now at these much higher prices yields this, you know, $400 uh, uh, positive return. Uh, but where we're going now that we have feeder cattle prices so high, uh, if we're going to see those kinds of returns, we got to get fed cattle prices even higher. And, and that may be, a, I think that's a pretty tough thing to ask for in the marketplace, even though uh, demand's quite good. So my expectation is that we go later in the year, into next year, we'll see those backing off uh, some. And, you know, we go back early in this data, look at 14, early 15, and then that transition 15 and 16 as supplies grew as as our calf prices and feeder cattle prices really outpaced the growth in fed cattle prices, we saw some negative returns then too. And so uh, as we go through this uh, period of where, you know, I would argue we're still cutting the cow herd, we still haven't started kicked off growth yet. Uh, so the potential to start expanding will drive calf prices higher, uh, really cut supplies some more and drive prices even higher. We're not quite there yet, but but certainly some positive returns uh, lately. A couple charts on prices I think are interesting. One is the box beef cutout. This is for choice beef. Uh, you know, heck, uh, it's certainly moved higher uh, than a year ago. It's backed off in the last couple of weeks. 
You know, we often would see some increase in wholesale prices this time of the year. Heck, grilling season, on top of some tighter supplies, uh, we've got prices pretty high. I think one of the good questions is, at what point do we get to prices where, uh, can we get to prices high enough that folks back off their purchases? Uh, you know, I, I think this is more kind of the normal sort of ebb and flow of prices so far. I don't think we have a lot of evidence that, that we see big changes in consumer behavior. They continue to buy and they continue to buy beef. And that I think that's a real positive, uh, you know, in the marketplace. I, I'll close with one more retail beef prices. Uh, this is the data that goes into the consumer price index. And I used it uh, today with you guys just to point out, if we look at the data that just came out for, for last month, uh, this was about $8.13. That is a record high uh, in this data set for retail beef prices. So, uh, you know, higher than the uh, record high the month before, which was $8.08. Uh, if we looked at the all fresh data series, which is also part of this uh, total data package, uh, it was not quite record high. Uh, but if we look at the choice beef, it was. And, what that should suggest to us is there is a, some, a seasonal component to this with higher prices here uh, in the summer, reflecting those higher wholesale prices. This also reflects some higher costs of getting it from where it's produced to, to your dinner table. Uh, but, you know, I, I think this is also some increasing evidence of, of the ability to move beef at higher prices that consumers continue to buy. So we don't have a lot of evidence yet of folks uh, really, really pulling back in a big way. And because of that sharply, uh, any, any kind of much lower prices. So I do think we may see some decline in this anyway, just seasonally. Uh, if we get at, get past our kind of peak grilling, grilling season and holidays, we certainly have falling wholesale prices. Uh, but again, remaining pretty elevated, high prices, uh, I, you know, I think for a good ways to go. So with that, that's my last slide. Um, let's see if I can stop sharing. There we go. Thank you, David. Let me stop recording here. They can say what we really think. <laughs> <laughs>